right, so let's dive into this. Um, so the packet, we'll, we'll do a pretty standard um, sort of flow of how I've done the other meetings. So we'll we'll go for the first 15 minutes, we'll take a 10 minute break. Um, we'll use that same kind of pattern throughout. Um, but if you need a break, certainly let me know. Uh, I wanna remind you all about the session pledge, our sort of shared group norms that we've that we've reiterated throughout the program. Um, and, you know, help me help others, um, especially when we go into breakout rooms to really invite in those quiet voices um, and then, uh, you know, continue to challenge ourselves as we're, as we're working through this. So I think, uh, actually, we've already kind of done this, but, um, but these are a little bit different questions. Um, so I was going to have us go into smaller groups to get you a little, a little bit of space to, to kind of connect. Um, the prompts I have for you is to talk about something you've learned and practiced so far in this program. What are the biggest questions that remain? Do you feel like we've already answered that or would you find value in go ahead and going into small groups to talk about these two things? Since I just got here, I'm comfortable either way. I'll go, I'll bend to the, the group, will of the rest of the group. So give me a thumbs up if you think we should go ahead and put in small groups and have this conversation. Okay, I'm getting no thumbs up. All right, so we'll move forward. <laughs> okay, so um, as a reminder, um, we, in all this work that we're doing, we wanna remind ourselves that people aren't broken and we're not trying to fix them. You know, when we talk about the fear that people are experiencing, you know, what, what you know, Drea and Emily, what you're talking about, um, Kate, what you were agreeing to, you know, when I think about the person that, that called me out of the blue Saturday, like, those are messages of people who've been told they're broken. They're messages of people that have been told that there's something wrong with them. And nobody wants to be told that, right? Um, we're trying to fix the systems in which we work. Does that mean that we have opportunities to learn and grow and change? Sure, yeah, and, and that's certainly part of this. Um, but in all of this work, we, we want to remember that we're trying to change the systems and the ways in which we operate, trying to remove those barriers and add the supports that are going to enable people to be most successful. And the stewarding and gatekeeping, even you know, we're going to be talking about this from both a high level philosophical standpoint, but there is a tool that, that I've shared with you. And Casey, if you could drop that link back in the chat, then, um, then you all can access that. Um, but we want to learn how to systematize this mindset. How do we systematize learning to think in a stewardship, stewarding mindset? And so um, what we'll end the day with, or what you'll get here now in the beginning, is a, a list of a set of four different prompts that enable us to begin to build this mindset. And so how can, so I want you to be thinking about how can I use this tool as a way to bring into my teams, to my meetings, to my classrooms, to my organization, to begin to help us all create the stewarding mind mindset. And I was really intentional when I originally created this curriculum is because when we're talking about stewarding and gatekeeping, I think so often that people, especially in this work, it wasn't an effort to make it more palatable that that wasn't the goal, but the effort was to make it a less of a cognitive load for people who are so reticent to talk about diversity, equity and inclusion. Because I surmise that you ask anyone if their goal in life is to be a gatekeeper for others and like very few people are going to like agree to that right um, if they do, then then we can ask them other series of questions, but people, I think even when i think about the the deep conservative nature of the people that live around us i'll, I'll give my dad as, a, as an example so part of my like trauma on saturday is that as i was gardening my dad was there with me and my dad is an amazing dad like he literally came to my house to help me like haul and shovel dirt so like that's a good man right but and that i put the phone on speaker when this person called me because i don't know i was scared and i thought my dad here is like he's going to have some form of protection. I wasn't asking him to defend me, but and after after we hung up, my dad practically defended the guy saying, well, he wasn't that rude. Right. And I was like, 
yeah. And my dad, who's been in engineering for like 40 years, was like, well, I, I could see some of his points. And I was like, all I really needed was a hug. And like, I'm sorry that happened to you. But the point is, is like when we're talking, talking about this if i had the wherewithal to continue talking deeper with my with my dad and with my parents about this i would help them understand the ways in which some of their mindsets some of their behaviors are gatekeeping behaviors right whereas i think that in their mind they want to be stewards right and as a part of their religious faith that's a big tenet of of their practice and i think that you know, on one set of values, that's a really key part of how they function. But until we help people to recognize the ways in which gatekeeping shows up in everyday kinds of interactions, the ways that we create barriers unintentionally, then we can't we can't invite people to challenge those. And so again, that's a, some of the example of, of why I like this language, because I think it's more um, it's more acceptable as a as a sort of you know, vocabulary to begin to enter into into this work. And so again, as is so much of our work, you know, I'm not always trying to change the way that people think. I'm trying to change the environment in which we make decisions. And so, you know, this tool amongst many of the other tools that I've provided to you throughout the, the program are strategies that change those environments in which we're able to make decisions so like using the stewarding tool, using the sort of nudging tools, using the other kinds of tools that, that, that I've shared, it changes that environment, it changes the structure that reminds us the ways in which we want to make decisions that help us. And so you can keep that in mind as well. Um, I always want to come back to, you know, thinking about the circle of influence um what is it that you can control what can you influence and really anchor in your thoughts and reflections and those two things uh, because there's lots of things that we can't control um and we can't influence and if we get stuck there we never make progress all right so early on in the program we talked about belonging we talked about how belonging is such a key part of this work and you know emily shared the story of interviewing her partner with the belonging exercise and he was like well sure i feel like i belong right like this place is made for me but he didn't say that but that's the sort of implicit realization of that and so our striving is to how do we create those environments where people don't have that force belonging where they don't have to adapt a, a adapt goodness, adjust, adapt, or assimilate into those spaces, but they have that structural belonging where they get to show up as their authentic and an asset-driven kind of space. I am reminded on Friday, I gave a keynote speech at the um, engineering equity, I, I don't know, engineering equity conference. And um, there was a young man that came up to me and the conference was focused on increasing the participation of Hispanic engine engineers. And <clears throat> I had talked I'd mentioned intersectionality in my talk and um, but for the most part for the entire conference was just focused on Hispanic identity and this young this person came up to me afterwards and throughout his uh, th throughout their explanation. They explained to me that they are both a um, non-binary, trans, queer, neurodivergent Hispanic person, and and explained to me how unseen and unsupported they felt in that institution. And they asked, like, he, uh, they asked, like, how do I have this conversation? And I said, you know, this is a particularly challenging conversation because of some of the you know, the, the great intentions, right? The intention of this engineering equity program is to create this inclusive space, but because of the lack of understanding of intersectionality, um, lack of understanding of the nuances of people's lived experiences, I don't believe that they are taking an intersectional approach, that they are deeply focusing on Hispanic ethnic identities rather than the whole person. And this person was just saying to me, almost in tears, how, how much they are having this forced belonging. They're having to 
and and they said to me that they actually show up to school and and how they presented was very masculine uh, on that day and they do it as a way to assimilate into that culture because that's what's expected of them right that they don't feel safe to be able to show up in a way that reflects their their gendered identity because of the not only the culture of the institution but the culture of the hispanic culture and the the mask the sort of masculinity culture that is so prevalent and patriarchal culture that's so prevalent within within that right and so if we want to create these environments where people can succeed we have to be thinking about what are the structures that we're building um i spoke with one of the pis um a little bit after that, trying to figure out how can I help this person? And she said, and I had thought I would take him to the dean, take them to the dean and allow them to have a conversation. And she said, please don't do that because the dean is from, uh, holds a, an identity that is deeply oppressive of queer identities. And that she feared that he wouldn't be a safe person to hear and to be able to support them. So she didn't use this language, but she feared that he would, the dean would have gatekeeping behaviors instead of the stewarding ones because of the deep ideologies from his own lived experience and religion that would prevent him from understanding the lived experiences and the needs and the requests for support that this young person needed. And so that's what brings us to this conversation is I imagine that this dean, I thought he was pretty fantastic and I think that he means well, right? And so how do we help leaders? How do we help ourselves? How do we help our organizations make sure that we're always functioning from this place of stewardship rather than gatekeeping? And so we're gonna talk about the differences between the two. Um, admittedly, my examples here are, they happen to be about tenure because when I originally wrote this curriculum, it was focused on the tenure process. But we'll have some opportunities for you all to contribute other examples from your own industries. All right. So gatekeeping is controlling and it's usually limiting general access to something like it's literally creating a gate, a barrier. It's the use of minimizing language discrediting suggestions or exclusionary actions that prevent others from achieving something or even feeling a sense of belonging. And ultimately, gatekeeping creates a hostile and exclusive environment. In addition, it is, and most of us are in education, and the entire nature of education and academia, like, in, like, inherently exacerbate the issue of gatekeeping like the tenure process, for example, is literally gatekeeping in most cases. Um, but in whatever industry that you're in it directly influences performance collaboration and turnover examples of gatekeeping could be anything around hazing elitism any kind of bias or discriminatory actions, um, and these are all certainly unproductive. So some specific examples of these are, um, uh, and, that, and these are source, Casey, if you could drop that link in the chat, I wanna make sure I give acknowledgement to the source of these examples. But um, for example, a candidate's articles are considered questionable because they're not published in one of the three acceptable mainstream journals in the discipline. Even though the department knew that their work was interdisciplinary and they were hired because of the interdisciplinary nature of their research. Another example is a candidate's book is discredited as a book because it isn't really long enough to be a real academic monograph, even though it was published by an academic press whose editors considered it long enough to be an academic monograph. So now I want us to think about some specific examples of gatekeeping in your industry. You can use the Slido or you can just unmute and, and talk about it. But what are some examples of gatekeeping in your industry? or your organization? I have a, a great one. Um, my boss comes from a, co a communications background. And so whenever I send any sort of anything, I'm asked to send it first to her, even though I've been doing the programming. 
And inevitably she tries very hard, but my voice in the email, in the document, in whatever gets completely rewritten. Um, so there's no authentic authenticity in my work. That's really awful, Emily. I'm sorry that's happening to you. It's it's a great example, and it's great to have tools and words to put with it. It actually feels more powerful to be able to to explain it and and give words to it. So thank you. Yeah. What else? Coach Grace, you're in a totally different industry than many of us. I'm curious some examples in, in your world. Sure. So I work in the financial industry, um, specifically for a credit union. And a lot of the gatekeeping that happens within the financial industry is with regard to people of color and income, getting loans, um, being able to buy homes, affordable homes. So that's something that we struggle with. And credit unions in particular um, really try to focus on their members and helping their members. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. I, I certainly recall, so I bought my first home last summer and it was really, really hard to buy a home as a single self-employed person. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I thought, what if I was also not white? how much harder would it have been for me to get financing because even though like it was it was just barrier after barrier after barrier because the system is not designed to sub to finance f people in my position i was astutely aware of that i was still privileged and having access to things that i may not have you know based on my skin color uh, for sure and and talking from a from a political standpoint we certainly know that redlining still exists right and these are huge systemic barriers when it comes to to people's access to homes um if we stick in that same example we've got also the gentrification of different communities that push many families of color out of their homes because of taxes um and the division of wealth Mm -hmm. the inability to build wealth that all you know for um, families of color yeah yeah thanks what else we got an example here am i teaching at a university whether you teach the courses which are hard enough quote quote unquote usually upper division without noticing that first year courses often involve more time additional work with students to help them learn how to participate in college yeah, th this is mine. Okay. Um, I, you know, there's so many ways that university systems uh, have gatekeeping. One of them is tenure. Um, for me, it's even having access to the tenure line, which I don't. I'm on a teaching track. Um, so the process of promotion is very different. And there's a gatekeeping process with that. Um, but even just um, all the little things that tend to accumulate as a status and what kind of work matters um, when we talk about these things really stack up. Um, you were on that committee, not this one. You published here, not there. You spoke at this conference, not that one. And um, yeah, it, 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 it hides behind the word rigor a lot of times at uh, universities, especially in engineering. Um, pre-college too, that word's heavily loaded in pre-college, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I even avoid saying the word rigor these days because it, most of the time if somebody says, well, you've made the course less rigorous, what they mean is I've shoved less content into it and I've made it more participatory, which for some students is harder and um, certainly calls upon me more in different and more challenging ways. So I I don't know, I it, to me, rigor by itself to say something is rigorous has become a toxic word and I avoid it. Even if I am trying to talk about how demanding a course is, I don't use that word because um, it, it is so loaded now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Drea or Ashley in y'all's work, what are what's some examples of gatekeeping that you see at uh, Michigan STEM?
you got a, a Cheshire grin on your face, Drea. What are you thinking of? <laughs> it's, uh, it's been a while since someone called me on the Cheshire grin, um, but that's exactly what it is. Um, I think for me, part of it, um, part of it's the like the vertical hierarchy of of what leadership is. So, like for example, we wanted to celebrate leaders and. Um, who, like there's questions over who got picked, why they got picked, like what's all going on, is this equitable, whatnot. And so like that was for me a really uh, strange experience over like, I think if we had just had more time, it wouldn't have felt like gatekeeping to me personally. Um, and then I think when it comes to other components, it, I, I, I think in education and like most of y'all on here are higher education, I'm K-12 and like you, you talk about, it's about the kids, it's for the kids and whatnot. Um, and then like the adults are treating each other awful. And so like for me, part of the wondering comes in cause like the moment, like you're trying to have a conversation around like DEI and then the well it's really just about the kids gets thrown out there it just shuts down the whole conversation because like the students treat each other how they see adults treat each other and um it, it's really hard to have that conversation when the adults don't recognize the harmful behavior yeah we got another example here. Um, Emily, is this yours talking about HR? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so titles within the corporate world function as gates. Also the power and hindrance of being in HR. This is less someone gatekeeping and rather the system being gated and full of barriers. Yeah. You want to talk a little bit more about it? Yeah, sure. I think I think it goes back to what other people are saying, like the structure, the inherent structure of the system that is hierarchical create systems of gatekeeping because they're creating gates, right? And I think especially when people think about it and act on it as a form of power, the title that you do or don't have, um, it can become and feel very gated, right? You can feel like there are gates blocking your way. And it really depends upon who you're working with and interacting with at that point too, right? Because I think the perfect example is HR, um, some people see that as a powerful position that has influence up and all around because they're interacting with all the divisions in a helpful way. And other people see it as you're putting on the HR hat and, oh gosh, you're talking to HR, like that type of connotation, right? So it, it is both a blessing and a curse, right, in many ways. And the same thing goes with the title. If somebody reads your title and assumes that means you don't have power, then they don't share information and knowledge with you and think that they have to go above your head or that you don't need to be included in the conversation, which can be hindering on your job performance or work, at least in my experience, right? Yeah. I think you bring up a couple of really key points here. One is sort of power and then and power as a structure in and of itself, and then power as it's embedded within the hierarchy of institutions. I'm reading uh, DEI Deconstructed and getting ready for the book club conversation today um which you're all welcome to come you don't have to read the book we'll just talk about good things but um but as a, as as i was listening to that particular chapter it reminded me so i worked i used to work for um a nonprofit, and i was a, a at a director level reported to the ceo and i had zero access to the board i mean zero like we weren't allowed to talk to the board i I wasn't allowed to talk to the board and I asked why she go oh, I'm trying to protect you and I was like I feel like there's also something else here like I don't feel like you're necessarily protecting me but like I'd like to present my team's work I like to have my team present their work to the board that to me makes me feel better as a leader than just handing something over to you right and um so the very first time that employees were allowed at a board meeting the board was like, they asked my like five minute slot turned into 50 minutes because they had so many questions. 
And it was an example that I tried to parlay to my boss, the CEO of like, you know, I think that you were trying to, maybe your intentions were good, but what you were actually doing is gatekeeping and limiting the progress of the organization because the board also needs to hear from the people who were doing the work, right? And so, and that's in an equity organization. <laughs> um, and so all of our good intentions could create barriers that prevent things. Uh, so what that's actually called is called power distance and power distance is a really common thing that we that's often sort of um, contributed to like individualistic and collectivist cultures, which we've learned a little bit about in the past. But power distance, even though individualistic cultures tend to have a low power distance, we manifest high power distances within our organizations. And what that means is power distance is the degree to which people from the lack general power within the society have uh, comfort to address people with higher power, right? And so within our organizations, if for me as a director, if I did not feel like I had power to address issues that were coming up from the CEO and the board, my goodness, what my, my, my team members feel like, right? That creates this deep power distance. So the sort of move to create like low hierarchy organizations reduces that power distance. Um, so let's look at the, this last quote here, or this last contribution here. English, English is the de facto language of academia. It works against students. We have a significant percent of international students and foreign born professors and is highly active in academic conferences. Yes, so again, I was at this conference that was down at the border of Texas and Mexico. It was for Hispanic people. Guess what percent of the conference was in Spanish? Zero, zero percent. And I asked um, at the reception afterwards with all the people with power, I was like, how about next year? Because they were talking about next year. I was like, how about next year we do some of it in Spanish? And they're like, well, some of us don't speak Spanish. I was like, but most of them do. <laughs> most of them do. And so um, why don't we allow some opportunities for the conference to be in Spanish? If we want to have some translations, that's great. But it was this assumption of like, why would we ever do anything other than English, you know? And again, that's certainly the, the de facto assumed that it would be in Spanish. And I could tell that uh, like the, the, the groups of people who were like running the, the booth, which you mean they were the people who like planned the whole conference, they would be speaking to one another in Spanish. But when I walked up, they'd all switch to English. And that's a very common assumption that they need to do that to make me feel comfortable. I actually speak quite a bit of Spanish. So it, I understood them and it didn't bother me, right? But even for them, they had to code switch just because the white person walked up and they've been conditioned to talk, speak in English so that I might not feel uncomfortable, right? Yeah, one, one of the things I've run into actually is a lot of my Hispanic students don't speak sp Spanish fluently. And so the other, the, the double-edged sword there is that assuming that just because you do have Spanish students in front of you that they speak, you know, Hispanic students in front of you that they speak Spanish is also a faulty assumption sometimes. Yeah. And so it, it all comes back to um, not presuming, right? Not assuming that the person in front of you, just because they present male, identifies male, just because they look Hispanic, that they speak Spanish, all those things. Just because you present white, that you don't speak Spanish or wouldn't be comfortable with them speaking Spanish. Yeah. So I I am humbled over and over again by just, it's just about the time I think I've got, uh, you know, the, the magic wand that is the right answer in all situations. I am humbled and reminded I don't. And that every time I enter react with a new person or a new group, I need to enter into a relationship with them again. And that involves getting to know them a little bit. And I don't know. I don't know. So I, I don't know. I find, I find a lot of these are interesting. You know, people make assumptions about what a title means. People have started assuming I'm tenured because I changed my title to associate uh, professor. I recently got my promotion. Um, but I, do I need to put teaching track on the end so that they have some context? Do I not? You know, this is this is the kind of thing I think about because I also want people to have 
be, be willing to reduce that power distance with me. And if I, for some reason, have power, which I don't always perceive, that's the other thing is I don't always realize how much power I've got. Um, I want them to be, I want to be approachable for people when there's a power different differential too. So. Yeah, so Kate, even what you're talking about with the language of your title, the only reason why that matters is because of the hierarchy the and the ideology that says that tenure is better than not tenured. Yes. Yeah, and so yes. if we didn't have that ideology, that belief system, it, it wouldn't matter whether you changed your title or not, right? right? I mean, it would matter that, yay, we're happy for you because you're successful, but the only people who are questioning that are like, oh, are you now as important as us? Yes. It's, are you in the club? And, you, the club? you know, I, one of the things I'm reminded of as we talk about this stuff is that human beings really want to have exclusive belonging to something. You know, we, we make clubs almost like we breathe, right? You, you get into a group of people and all of a sudden there's an in-group and an out-group regardless of, of the situation. And I, you know, we can use that for good or we can let it fester and become exclusionary and gatekeeping. And so, you know, it's, um, I don't know, I think about this a lot because people are just going to naturally want to create ex in exclusivity. They want to feel like they're part of something special. And um, how do we manage that need to feel like you're part of some inner circle of something without it being, without you gatekeeping out the people who would maybe be the best leaders in your organization? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a yeah. weird balance. Yeah. Emily, what are you thinking? I was just thinking about that because <laughs> my day job is affinity groups, right? Our employee resource groups. And that is like the slipperiest slope, right? That you're bringing people together and they're finding belonging by finding commonality. But inevitably, it's only one facet of a much larger group, right? So the only thing that I have found, and it is a hard stretch, right? Because it, again, it's it's still the same thing is that um, intersectionality, Right whether that's within the group or within the network of groups, where can you find commonalities that, that the intersectionality and advocacy and allyship, I think that's one of the biggest pieces um, for me at least that I want to belong, not because I identify, but because I want to support. And I think that there's a lot of untapped there that has to be pulled in, but it, it's a challenge to do because not everybody feels empowered or that they have the right to be an ally or an advocate, which becomes another slippery soap. But to your point, how do you, how do you make sure that everyone isn't, doesn't feel like on the perimeter if they're not part of whatever that perceived tight knit inner circle is, so to speak, it's not easy for sure. Yeah. I'm reminded once again of one of the things that this uh, bully said to me on Saturday is that he said, um, you know, I don't like that they create these clubs for people, you know, he's like, it's like, you know, if you, we created a club just for white people, that wouldn't be okay. And I'm like, well, those, those affinity groups aren't just for those people. Like, if you want to show up, go, he's like, well, I'm part of the Asian group. And I was like, great like <laughs> go support the others if you're curious they're not excluding you they're creating a space where they can facilitate their own belonging and if you want to be an advocate and ally like show up right but it's that perception that by creating this that somehow he feels that you've now created a gate that doesn't allow him to be successful when the intent of the affinity groups is to create a, a stewarding a sense of belonging for those individuals um, so yes, there, there is that, that perception that, that we're facing, right. With, um, even when we create spaces of belonging, somehow someone inherently then feels ex excluded by it. So, uh, what I want to do now is let's go ahead and take our break and we'll come back at the hour and then we'll dive into talking about stewardship. All right. We'll see you back in 10 minutes. All right, welcome back everyone. So now we're gonna talk about the good stuff, stewardship. <laughs> 
So stewardship is being entrusted with what's in your care and creating an environment where people can grow and improve while enhancing their well-being. It creates an enriching and inclusive environment. So let's look at a couple of examples. And these examples, Casey, you can drop that link in the chat here. But um, so some examples from, and, and I wanna make sure you get the source of where I, I found these examples. So uh, this person, Rick writes, when someone expresses a challenge or a loss, instead of explaining why these are all dues people pay or how they're doing things wrong, choose to be compassionate, respect their journey and normalize the struggle. We were all once there ourselves. So certainly the pay your dues culture is something that I experience so much in industry um, as in working as an engineer. And it was just this mentality of just like, you know, just work hard and maybe someday you'll recognize it of like, you can't be competent until you've had all of the struggles that we've all had. Um, I remember somebody told me that I hadn't truly earned my PhD because um, I had a computer that allowed me to a word processor that allowed me to type and edit my dissertation um, that to only have truly earned a dissertation would mean that you'd had to type it on a typewriter. And I was like, well, if that's not gatekeeping language, I don't know what is, right? <laughs> um, I'm sorry that you were born at a time that didn't have that. Like, that's that's a struggle. Like, I admit that. But, you know, come on, don't tell me I haven't earned my degree because technology exists. Um, or when someone expresses a win or an achievement, instead of reducing that experience or shadowing that achievement behind your own, you choose to give praise. Share that these achievements and victories will stack themselves into even greater ones. Help them keep the rocket fuel burning. Uh, this is something that's actually connected to people with fixed mindsets. So pick people with fixed mindsets um, have a really hard time celebrating the success of others because they somehow feel that it takes away from their own success. And so when we have that mentality, like it, it reduces our capacity to to celebrate when others succeed. Um, I, you know, when we think about if you've heard of the Queen Bee syndrome, have you all heard of Queen Bee syndrome? Yeah. Um, that terminology was popularized by the um, by the dissertation that then became the movie Mean Girls. Um, but it talks about this notion of, especially in, in environments where women aren't always likely to have greater numbers, that there's this sort of unconscious belief that I have to be queen bee because only one of us is gonna make it. So that woman then puts down all the other women around them um, in an effort to sort of survive and thrive higher, right? And so, you know, we've probably all experienced women who don't, maybe don't even know that they're doing that, um, but it puts down the success of others, um, thinking that somehow it doesn't allow them success. Um, interestingly, I've experienced this as a, um, as a young-ish professional um, who serves a lot of education in, you know, schools and uh, different kinds of universities that there's a pay your dues culture that you shouldn't get to be a consultant until you've spent 40 years in higher ed and then you go be a consultant. How dare I skip the 40 years of trauma and just jump right to do what I want to do. And I have received, received some like legitimate shade from women who are diversity, equity and inclusion experts who don't support me because they think somehow I've not paid my dues and not earned the opportunity to be a consultant. Um, this is not stewarding. This is gatekeeping, right? So now I want us to talk about some examples of stewarding in your industry. So what are some examples of stewarding? I actually just gave you more examples of gatekeeping. Those are much easier to, to, um, to define. Um, Oh, she's a good friend of yours. Oh my gosh. Now I'm super jealous. That's amazing. I'd like to meet her. Um. <laughs> I can, I can definitely connect you. She and I actually dance together. She just uh, came out with a, ne a new book called courageous discomfort. Um, oh. That's what? about racism and it's really, really interesting. Oh, that's so cool. Thanks. Um, yeah. Well, that's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. 
Uh, so let's talk about stewarding. So some examples of stewarding in your industry, what comes to mind? Like how, so if we go back to the definition, so the definition of stewarding is um, being entrusted with what's in your care, creating an environment where people can grow and improve while enhancing their sense of well-being. I'm dropping that in the chat. So there's the definition in the chat. So what are examples of stewarding in your industry or personal examples? So you don't have to use Slido. You can just unmute and talk. So hey, Sabrina, welcome. Glad you're here. Um, we have an environment where we're encouraged to nominate uh, people for these really small awards that are called cause for applause. And you, you don't even have to string together more than four or five sentences. But um, what I like about it in contrast to the big formal awards that our university gives out for teaching and research achievement and that kind of thing is um, you, you um, can't nominate yourself for those larger awards. You, you kind of have to because there's so much data they need. And number two, it's really humble. It's just, hey, this person comes through for me when I've got to get a grant report in on time or this person, I notice how well they're working with students. And um, it means that we share the um, recognition that we're, we're striving to be learner centered and that kind of thing. Um, but it also comes with a little bit of money, which to me, that's the resource they're stewarding, right? Is, is they actually give out money for these little cause for applause and, and you have to nominate someone else. You have to, to give it away. So I like that, that sort of those humble little awards sometimes mean more than the big fat ones, you know? Yeah, because those big fat ones really come with money. <laughs> what what you also explained to me that I like is that it's it's creating a culture of elevating and spotlighting others. Like that is that is really creating a system of stewarding where we're elevating others um, and shining lights on on good things that they're doing. I like that. What else? I think one of the things that um, have come across my my plate is that I actually have a teacher. I hand out like well, I don't hand out. Um, teachers can apply for classroom mini grants out of my STEM program for me, and um, they get to decide what they want to do and whatnot. And um, we, I, I finally had someone turn uh, in a sturgeon in the classroom. Uh, project proposal with a tribal component because sturgeon in um at least I know in Michigan is a very important fish for um the tribal communities and and not just like spiritually but also ecosystem like uh, at an ecosystem level too and so they've created curriculum that can go along with um many many schools you call salmon in the classroom but um, many of my schools here have switched over to sturgeon because of how important the fish is. And for me, stewarding in this sense is just like using that specific project to elevate here's how you can include like the importance of this fish, the fact that it's native and like the tribal um, meaning behind all of it in a project and just showing people how this is all connected as opposed to elevating like the salmon in the classroom, which is a non-native fish and doesn't have a direct connection to the peoples within our communities and is just really a sporting fish. So I think that's an opportunity of stewardship from a very technical lens. Yeah, thanks, Drea. Coach Grace. So I think we have a couple of um, things. Internally, uh, one of the things that we have is we've instituted a coaching program because we do a lot of promoting, promoting promotions from within. That's how we grow our talent internally. And so the coaching program really is there to help them transition from an individual contributor to a people manager. It's a requirement if they're going to be managing people. Now, if they are not gonna be managing people, but they'd like to go through the program just for professional growth, they can go through it too, which is great. And there's a lot of support from that uh, because the manager has to be a part of the process. And then from an industry perspective, we are a cooperative. And so we function under the eight principles of cooperatives. And one of them is people helping people. 
So there is no competition between our credit union and another credit union. We, um, so we share a lot of information. So I can call someone out from South Carolina, you know, um, tell credit union and say, hey, can you share with me some information of how you handle this or what programs do you have in place? And they are happy to do that because they, they know that there is no competition. We're not competing for the same members. We are here to serve our members. Yeah, that's beautiful. I like that. And what are, I wonder, you know, even with that sort of trying to reduce competition, so even if you sort of systematize a value system that says, hey, we're trying not to compete, where you probably still have people in the organization who still have a deeply competitive sort of mindset. I'm curious, how does, how do you notice that, how that plays out of like, if you have many individualists who have been deeply ingrained and wired to like compete, 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 how, what is it, how does that show up in an organization that's saying, hey, we're not here to compete, we're here to support? That's interesting. Um, so that's actually part of our hiring process and what we look for in our candidates is servant leadership. Mm, so if they can't give us examples of how they give back to the community or their, their way of being a servant leader, they usually, if they come in, they don't feel comfortable and they don't stay. Mm. Usually they don't come in because our staff have been here average tenure is 15 years. Wow, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, so that shows me that you've systematized creating a culture of people that share mm -hmm. your values. Yeah, that's beautiful, thanks. And I think it goes to our tagline. I mean, our, our mission statement is simple. It is to improve the lives of our members, period. That's it, there's no long extraneous, there's nothing. It's to improve the lives of our members, that is it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Emily, Sabrina, Ashley, Kate, did you already share one? I feel like I have the classic example. Um, the employee resource groups are uh, at my company are employee led. Um, so these individuals raise their hands, these passionate driven individuals raise their hands and I get the extreme privilege of helping watch them blossom and grow and have the opportunity to create the, those uh, inclusive environments um, where they get to lean into those strengths that maybe they don't even get a chance to in their day job. Um, and then by example, they also get to be uh, those uh, servant leaders as well for co-chair uh, committee leads. So people that aren't necessarily at that level of being able to lead all the time, but want to help out and, and lead. So um, that that is the, the thing that keeps me going on a regular basis is being there to support that system of stewarding that we've created for the employee resource groups. I'm curious, and, and we have may, may have talked about this before, and I've forgotten, but does the company support those people who step into those volunteer roles and, and honor their the workload that that adds to them? Like, in what So this ways? has been an interesting new conversation because I think it's become a conversation in general around employee resource groups uh, recently, at least of what I've seen. Um, so they, they, they are supported in the sense that we... Um, we brought in an external partner to do a three-part certification course for them. Uh, we have regular like quarterly uh, group meetings um, to go over feedback and improvement and, and pieces like that. But I recently was asked if there was any sort of equity or pay that goes with that in terms of recognition. And I know this is like the newest, hottest topic because they are putting on a lot more time, right? And I think it's an interesting thing right to have that as a question mark because i think there's so many forms of volunteering that aren't paid right so it's an interesting i would love to hear other people's opinions on it honestly um not necessarily right now in this moment but it's it's an interesting concept so yeah and the reason why i ask is because often the way that power is distributed and is that we say we call on people who've been traditionally marginalized and excluded to then represent and serve and create those equitable structures for employees that our organizations haven't managed to do and this is a tremendous burden it's tremendous labor um that 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 people are then carrying and it can be at 
the you know to the disadvantage of their actual job and those and those expectations i don't know that there's a right answer but i do think that there is this sort of when we're talking about stewarding are are we st- again i'm not picking on you emily i'm picking mm-hmm. on the system in which we create these things but like when we say hey you know thank you for leading that um and they're stewarding opportunities for others but in what ways does that labor steward their career or yeah, that's that- been a conversation that's been brought up too, because we have um, executive sponsorship. So the C-suite members sponsor each group. So there's one or two that they meet with. So first and foremost, they're getting exposure, right, to those individuals and getting a chance to meet and give face and and and, and create an, a quote unquote name, right, where that power structure, they would never get the opportunity potentially. And I also think when done properly, within their own divisions by their bosses and within that structure, they're celebrated and they use and leverage that. So I know a perfect example is one of our leaders of our um, black group. He's specifically within um, uh, within security, which is a tight knit group. And his boss on more than one occasion has been like, will you please lead this? Will you please? And so there's examples of him taking that leadership from um, the the black group and bringing it in and building awareness in a smaller setting that isn't even about the employee resource group, but he gets to be a leader in a different environment. Um, so when I think when the structure of the team and space that they inhabit is thinking inclusively, then it can be that, but it's not always the case, right? Yeah. Thanks, Emily. Any other examples that are coming to mind stewarding? Well, the, the most obvious one in my life is, is this workshop and lab that's right on the other side of this glass here. So um, this workshop is referred to as InWorks. It's a makerspace, right? We've got a bank of 3D printers. We have a laser cutter. We've got a bunch of other equipment. And a lot of the other workshop and lab spaces on campus are limited to use um, while you're participating in a particular course. And this space is not. Uh, any student who walks in can take the basic safety training class and um, learn to use the equipment. And in fact, we don't even limit what they do on the equipment to class projects. We say, we want you to have learned the equipment and we know that if you wait till you have a class project, you won't have the skills on that particular fabrication machine. So come back in and make somebody a gift for Christmas. I don't care. Um, that we do have the limitation of you're, you're not allowed to produce things for a business um, on university owned equipment because it was paid for by taxpayer dollars or whatever. We're not supposed to support businesses. But I find that a lot of other lab spaces on campus could be supported this way and be more open. And they're not. They're open only for the use of a particular course or a particular subset of students. And um, this is taking resources, though. This is taking dollars in terms of having lab staff, you know, um, populate it and and do the training and that kind of thing. And so, in this environment we're in right now of budget cuts, I'm being asked, do we really need InWorks to be open as many hours as it is? Do we really need InWorks to be open to students outside of engineering? Do we really need InWorks to be open to all engineering majors? And I'm having to sort of justify our existence. Um, yet at the same time, what's the difference between it being open and closed? Uh, uh, one student worker's wage. Mm-hmm. And to me, being more gatekeeping about it, it would reduce my work a load a little bit because I do manage, because we've cut other staff positions, I do end up managing the space. But I, I don't know. It, I, to me, a lot of the behaviors I see that come down to gatekeeping I realize our defensiveness from people who are tired of overwork. I had a a professor at another university tell me at one point that she was glad that there was a weed out class before her course, because it meant that her course stayed a manageable under 50 students per section, rather than blossoming up to 75, because she didn't have TA support to help her grade. She She would provide a worse education for the students who made it through to her, So she was glad there was this one class that kept weeding out students before hers because she wasn't going to get another instructor to help her. She wasn't going to get TA support. So there's this weird management of resources. You know, if we're if our job is to be entrusted with resources and to use them wisely, sometimes these gatekeeping behaviors 
are a, a form of self-defense because the system isn't set up to let us be generous stewards of the resources that we should be. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I don't have a good answer. I, I mean, I was horrified when that professor told me she was happy that this one class was gatekeeping her course. I, that's ridiculous. We should not ever want students to yeah. fail. We, we should want students to be able to learn. And uh, of course, we're well, most students need to take two runs at that class. That's ridiculous. That should not be how that, that means that's a failure to teach. That's a failure to design the educational system correctly. Yeah. But she was grateful for it because of what the way the rest of the system was set up. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I think, like you said, there's no great answer to that. It acknowledges the challenges of the system. The system's not set up for students to succeed. It's not set up for the, the faculty to be successful in teaching whatever quantity of students that are that are put into their place. Yeah. All right. Thank you for sharing that. So let's let's dive forward. Um, I I have a set of four four sets of prompts. I've named them relation, communication, location, situation. We're going to dive into each of these. And so these are a set of questions, and these are in your handout on page five. And so um, we're going to talk about each section of these, and then you're going to have a chance to go into small breakouts, probably in pairs, maybe two groups of three, maybe two groups of three, um, to talk about how you might be able to use these kinds of priming questions to help you. Now, these questions, these are tools that we can both use individually and collectively. So as an individual, there are questions that we can ask ourselves, you know, in a self-reflective, self-awareness, personal growth kind of way. Um, they are questions that we can also ask as small teams, as large organizations, and whatever level, right? But they're prompts that allow us to begin to think about, are we practicing stewardship instead of gatekeeping? So let's talk first about relation. So relation is, is really about the connection that we have with others, the, the relationship. I think, to be honest, I was probably trying to be a little bit too creative with like finding words that all end in T-I-O-N, but um, but they, they certainly fit, but bear with me here. <laughs> so relation is, are we asking questions about, are we choosing compassion and empathy, right? Um, are we, because this is a choice. We can choose to judge. We can choose to not see the needs of other people. Um, or we can choose all kinds of things. But if we are trying to create an enriching and inclusive environment, we must choose compassion and empathy and and however in whatever way that we are operating next are we prioritizing trust and maintaining integrity and so um are, are we building trust and maintaining integrity so trust takes a lot of work right trust is an effort to build that connection um it means that we're doing what we're say we're going to do so that's the definition of integrity that i've had since i was a kid right Integrity means that you do what you say you're going to do. And so, you know, when we, when I think about all of these organizations who do all of these sur surveys, like, hey, we're going to do a survey because we want to create equitable and inclusive environments. But, and so there's all this good intention on the front, but then there's often not enough follow up on the end to actually take any action from that. So that is not stewarding behavior. It may have started in good intentions, but when we have these kinds of surveys and we don't take action, we're not building trust, we're not maintaining integrity because we're suggesting that we care, we're suggesting that we're gonna take action, but there's very little often a seen on the flip side of that as an example. Um, the third bullet I have here is a question of, are we prioritizing others over our egos? Um, I may have shared this example with you all before, but, and if I have just kind of bear with me, but I am reminded with this about the example with American Society for Engineering Education. Um, so this last year, we, um, I put forth the, one of my colleagues, Dr. James Holly Jr., who is a sort of young tenure track faculty, um, and for a distinguished lecture. Distinguished lectures at our annual conference are a big deal. Um, it's a big deal to be selected. It comes with a little bit of money um, and it comes with a lot of prestige. 
and I put him forward. I planned his whole talk and I, I planned like the, the setting for his talk. He did his talk, right? But like, and then at the end of it, a, a man stood up and said, this is like the most non-distinguished, distinguished lecture I've ever seen. He said something to that effect. And what, and then like the whole crowd was like in an uproar. And so what happened is, is he, in his mind, he is a sort of elder in the organization the distinguished had always meant old, meaning you had been paid your dues, you had done all of the work and that you've had this long distinguished quote unquote career. And that's why you got to be called distinguished. Well, fast forward to this year's annual conference and that same person led an initiative to change the lectures. They are now no longer called distinguished lectures. They're now called topical plenaries. And I, contacted them and I said I have a, a problem with this like you this is gatekeeping language this is saying that young people can't be distinguished this is saying young professionals all these kinds of things and all of this was about their egos their egos as a sort of academic elite within the organization and so um, I was told they'd put the center advisement I was like it's not too late to change it this year you can make them go back to being distinguished but the point is, is that we, this person who was well-intentioned because they actually changed it, their intention was like, we want to create a more inclusive opportunity for people to, to present. But what I was really saying is we don't want to call people who we don't think are distinguished, distinguished. That's the hidden language of that. And so that's the sort of examples of relation. Now, communication, two questions here. Are we communicating? Um, are we communicating high expectations and our belief that our high expectations can be met? This is actually connected to Carl Yeager's work. Um, his this his work is called Wise Feedback, and it involves two components: you're communicating high expectations and uh, and a convocation or uh, not a convocation, like that you're expressing that they can meet those high expectations. When we combine those two things with our feedback, it's been proven to create trust, particularly between people who have higher privilege and those who are from non-dominant groups. And so to communicate to in a stewarding mindset, that means that we aren't reducing our expectations of other people, that we're maintaining our expectations and we're having a true belief that people can meet those things, right? Um, because so often what we see is, um, again, you'll have to forgive me because I keep going back to this bully call I got on Saturday, but his point was, is like, you know, we're lowering our expert expectations, we're hiring people who aren't qualified, and I, you know, said to him, like, how do you know they're not qualified? Just because you hire somebody, hires a person of color or a person who looks different than you, that's your assumption that they're not qualified. That's your assumption and perhaps bias that thinks they're not qualified. Um, but we can have those high expectations and still hire amazing people um, and, and believe that people can meet those expectations. Uh, next prompt here is, are we encouraging and listening to diverse perspectives in this space? Um, and when I say diverse, I mean diverse in the sense of they're from non-dominant groups, um, so if we're trying to create a stewarding environment, we need to always be asking who, you know, whose voices aren't being heard and how do we make sure that we are hearing them? How are we actively striving to, to find the voices of people who think different than the common ways of knowing and doing and invite them into this space? The next set of questions are on sort of location the ways in which you um, sometimes need to change your position, like literal position to elevate others. Are we making space for other ways of knowing and doing? The example that I've been on a little bit of a tirade lately is the example for from my professional organization and this big National Science Foundation. Um, oh, by the way, so I actually, you, you've heard me talk about this in previous sessions, but the example is this huge, huge grant to create this blueprint for systemic change in engineering education and higher ed. And on day one of this huge program that's brought together 130 professionals to, to talk about and create this blueprint, there were zero students invited. And I asked, I said, this is a problem. Okay, so in my keynote on Friday morning, um, I called it out. 
And then the, the principal investigator of that grant was the lunchtime keynote. Um, so that was real exciting. <laughs> uh, but the point is, it's like the gatekeeping language that was brought up when I said, why aren't we, why are students not here? Somebody openly said, well, what would they know about higher education? That is gatekeeping. That is not stewarding. That is not making space for not only other ways of knowing and doing, but that's creating space stakeholders to have a seat at the table and trusting that they know enough about their own lived experience to contribute, right? It's making sure that you are never designing something for people without them. Um, the next question here is, are we stepping out of the limelight to elevate the contributions of others? So this is something that takes a lot of function of privilege, um, a, an awareness of privilege and an intentional effort to make sure that you're providing the limelight or that you're stepping out of the limelight to make sure that the people whose voices truly need to be served are being served. Um, one of the examples that I shared on the learning management system was a little snippet from Brandy Carlisle's book. Um, if you have it, if you have, it's like a, a couple of minutes. If you haven't watched that, watch it. Um, it's a little video. You could just listen to it. But it's an example of how she literally stepped out of the limelight of on a stage to like elevate the other people who were there um, because, you know, she recognized the need of, of her privilege in that moment to do that. And sometimes that can be hard, right? Especially when it goes back to our egos. If it goes back to our egos, if our egos, egos are at play and I think, well, I need to do this, I need to be in this limelight because that, again, that individualistic kind of mindset, mindset sometimes we really have to move. We've got to change location and make sure that we're providing that spotlight for other people. And the last set of questions, and we're going to go into breakout rooms, is situational. So are we intentionally engineering an environment that's conducive to growth and well-being are we perpetuating or upholding oppressive behaviors that limit access for traditionally marginalized or minoritized groups and so again this is a deep reflection around whatever it is that we're planning are we creating some systems policy structures are we creating opportunities that are upholding those oppressive behaviors and beliefs? Or are we create removing those barriers and adding in the supports? Are we creating environments that are helping people to grow and to thrive? Or are we not, right? So we are or we aren't. It's sometimes a little bit black or white there, but we need to be intentionally try, trying and striving to create these environments. Um, again, back to my bully, I hope he's not a manager, right? I'd hate to work for that guy because he's certainly not thinking about the environment that's creating a space for people to feel a good sense of well-being, to feel, to feel valued, included, and affirmed. Um, and and he is but one voice that represents many, right? He is one voice that represents many within all the industries, right? Um, and so if we want to create enriching and inclusive environments, and by the way, when we create these enriching inclusive environments, our challenge often is to help people who have these mindsets like my my bully, I'm just going to keep calling him that. Um, th it helps everyone succeed, right? It's it's that rising tide raises all the boats. We all do better. We all we all experience better things when we have these environments. So what we're going to do next is um, we're going to break you into groups. I think we, we've got time to do like, um, like let's do like eight minutes. Um, Casey, if you can set them up for that. Okay. Um, let's, do, let's do groups of three. I want you to talk about how could you use the stewarding prompts in your role, your team, your organization to intentionally engineer inclusion. And then also add, what would you add or change? Um, and I, I certainly welcome your feedback for that, but we're going to talk about this for the next eight minutes or so we'll come back and debrief it if you're if you want to make sure you have them in front of you, you can download the handout um, or I can I'll drop in the link for engineer inclusions website um, where I have them posted there as well. So Casey, you can open the rooms whenever you're ready. Welcome back. Welcome back. All right. So Casey just dropped into the chat a link to this post on my website so you can share this with any of your colleagues um, and it has the down uh, a different download but a 
a, a similar format. Um, the fastest eight minutes ever. Oh no. Um, well, let's debrief a little bit. Um, you're going to get to go back into breakout rooms in the next hour for some application of this as well. Um, we're going to look at a case study. Um, and so let's share a little bit. What were some of the things that you talked about? For us, uh, at least the, the example Sabrina gave involved is sort of an interpersonal gatekeeping. It wasn't necessarily a part of the hierarchical structure of the organization, but it was more like so up here telling you that's not how we do things or that why would you reach out to this other person without talking to me first? And I, I find that sometimes the gatekeeping is actually internal. I stop myself from trying something or doing something when I haven't been told explicitly not to, but um yeah, good examples, but sometimes it's really nuanced. And as Coach Grace reminded us, it's something we have to keep practicing. Yeah, that's a great example, Kate, and, and elevating what Sabrina was saying. I, I'm assuming you were talking about like the point being that it can play out at all four levels of oppression, right? Ideologies, the interpersonal, institutional, and then now that gatekeeping becomes internalized. What else? Like we talked a little bit of the nuances of like people are um, kind of limited in um, the understanding of what social justice like work looks like. And so, for example, they're willing to fight and stand up for, um, you know, fighting against racism. But the moment it comes to homophobia, like it, it's all of a sudden, like it, it's not treated as an ism in that sense. And so it, it's really difficult to be like, well, it's not this facilitator's like, it, and, and they like to assign it to a person like, it, oh, that facilitator was just off. I'm like, no, actually, if you go through enough workshops, you'll see that if you actually take time to reflect on them all, that like, there's actually a thread that goes between it all. And there's a reason why I'm just like, I want to rip down some of the signs about Susan B. Anthony simply because like she was only willing to fight for feminism. She was not willing to fight um, for equality and races. And I'm just like, this is, this is not, you can't tear one ism down while you're fighting for another ism. Like that's just, that, that means you don't have the courage of your convictions and you don't actually understand what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Drea. Coach Grace, you, you'd unmuted. Did you want to add something? No, you changed your mind. Okay. Emily, Sabrina, Ashley, anything you want to add? I, I will say that Sabrina, that that interpersonal gatekeeping with an individual, I've experienced that as well. Um, with one colleague and it's it's a challenge to like face it and come from a place of empathy even though you're struggling i for me at least i've struggled to work with this individual because of the gatekeeping attitude that they have and I, I faced it face on and they pulled the fact that they have a higher title than me even though we're on the same team as a concept and i was like completely thrown um by that as a concept of like why would that even matter right um so as hard as it was to hear and and face, I was like, okay, well, this this is how this person operates. And now it's given me the tools to say, okay, how do I steward within that and navigate around that, um, knowing that that person is going to continue to do that with other people that they interact with because we work closely together, right? So it means that sometimes there's an uphill battle when it comes to other people bringing initiatives to that individual. And then they have to come to me to get maybe a yes or like, let's figure out a solution, right? Cause they're stopping everything rather than, than working through that. I also have to share, I grabbed a mug during, during break and it's the perfect example of titles. It's an office reference. <laughs> so, and instead of assistant to the regional manager, it's assistant regional manager. And I think that that's the mentality that you kind of have to come in with when you think about, especially titles, but when it comes to power, like take out those extraneous words and just be what you know you can be. And that's how you can steward the best you can, right? Yeah. Yeah, so so what you've brought up is this sort of sometimes the challenge of what, what do we do when we're facing gatekeeping? And this is certainly something that we face as practitioners of this work, trying to elevate 
the efforts to create inclusive environments that support well-being that we're going to face gatekeeping um that we're going to face you know people that are in our way certainly one opportunity is to find ways that we can talk to people sometimes that's not possible sometimes we have to learn how to skirt around them figure out how do we dig under the gate jump over the gate whatever it is and that takes some labor for us to try to figure out how to navigate those systems uh, to get the work done that we need to do. One of the examples I like that, that came up in, in the DEI deconstructed book is to literally kind of map out the sort of power structures within your in your environment um, and to think about what are those ways that power is um, is being played out and how do you navigate around problematic parts of that structure to get done what you need to get done. And so that's something I'm going to study a little bit more and figure out how to create an activity around that, because I do think that that um, similar to how we hit, we did an exercise around systems. I think it's similar to that, but it's really kind of figuring out, you know, if we want to accomplish our goals, sometimes we have to figure out what are those barriers that we're facing and figure out how to navigate around them, because we're not going to get everybody on our side. Um, Emily added in the chat that we should be value translators. What does that mean? And then we'll go to break. Um, sometimes there's a disconnect between the, those that understand the need for DEI and the practitioners stuck in the middle. And then you have those that you're helping serve, right? You're being the steward between them. And you have to translate what that value is to create not, not maybe not a business need or explain the importance of the why, even though it's, and it's hard because I think when you're close to DEI or it's something that you're passionate about, it's hard to explain why, because you're like, it's just the right thing to do. Right. And you have to dig in a little bit and explain the underlying why and explain why it's going to make you a better company, better individual, better team, better, whatever it may be. Right. So being that, that connective tissue between DEI like goals and moving the needle and and the individual, I think is what what the intent was with that. But I really liked the the concept of that as a visual. Yeah, I, I like that. I think also it's a function of power structures that force us to have to continue to like yeah. make the case for diversity, make the case for inclusion. Um, one of my favorite articles was written by one of my PhD committee advisors. And, and she, it's called shifting the default. And so her argument was mainly for the engineering education academic space of like, why do we, it was an argument to reviewers of papers because she kept getting back feedback that says, well, you haven't made the case for why we need to like study this. And so her point is like, I think that this has already been proven. I don't need to write a section in every single paper that I write that says diversity, equity, and inclusion is important. So now the default should be you have to write a, paper, a section on why you are not studying diversity, equity, and inclusion in whatever research study you're doing. So it shifts the default to the people who are not working on inclusion. And so again, it puts that, that onus on people who are not creating system structures and environments um, or data and analysis that just doesn't disaggregate by multiple intersecting identities. So let's take a 10 minute break and we're going to come back and we're going to do a couple of additional concepts that will now allow us to look a little deeper into the, um, the case study. If you're a person who likes a tactile look at something, you may want to print the case study from the handout. Um, otherwise, if you've got multiple screens, you'll be fine. All right, we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Thanks, everyone. Welcome back, everyone. Right, welcome back. Let's see, why is there a black screen right there? Okay, so let's dive in. Now what we're gonna do for this, uh, this last hour is we're gonna talk about a couple of additional concepts. Some of them will be additive to what we've already learned. Some of them will be things we've already touched on, but I just wanna refresh your memory of them. And then we're gonna use those concepts to, to talk about the case study here in a second. 
So this is something that we haven't talked about before, or at least I'm pretty sure we haven't, but that is talking about ruling relations. So ruling relations, these are, um, as the definition here on the screen says, and Casey, you can drop that citation in the chat. These are the internally coordinated complex of administrative, managerial, professional, and discursive organization uh, that regulates, organizes, governs, and otherwise controls our societies. Um, the article goes on to say it is not yet monolithic, but yet it is pervasive and pervasively interconnected. And so the thing about ruling relations is that both people experience and reproduce ruling relations. And so those the, those ruling relations, they coordinate the organization of, of institutions and disciplines to value certain forms of knowledge and knowing, certain ways of investigating the world, and then certain modes of collecting and analyzing data. And so despite not having bodies or agency, relations can then become codified within our policies and practices, and then they do work. So they're actually working on behalf of the institution and then they can act in the interest of the institution over the potential people, the actors over time. And so what makes relations ruling is that they primarily serve the interest of the institution over the people who participate in them. And so ruling relations, these are the sort of structures, both implicit and otherwise, that that reproduce all of these sort of structures of power so keeping this in mind we've already talked pretty extensively about whoops excuse me about systems of oppression and so keeping in mind not only the systems of advantage but the systems of a disadvantage which are these this the the functions of oppression the next concept I want you to keep in mind is that of social capital we've not talked a lot about this um, but Casey you can add those two citations there in the chat I'm not, no, not the second one. The second one's expired, but the first one is good. And so typically when we think about capital, we're thinking about money, similar to stewardship. We're like thinking about money. Um, but when we think about capital from a social standpoint, it's all of the sort of embedded resources within our networks. Um, it includes the flow of information, our social ties that allow us to exert influence, certifications or or your sort of social educational credentials um, and all of the sort of reinforcement support and acknowledgement of those things. So social capital, if you want to read more, certainly read from um, Nan Lin's book on social capital. It's a theory of uh, structure and action. And then Yasso has written an article that's been really well cited um, in recent years about uh, whose culture has capital. So it's a critical race theory discussion of it. So if you haven't read that, I certainly recommend it. Um, let's see, I lost my screens. Where did you all go? Um, where did the chat go? Okay, there we go. Um, um, looks like you can put link number two in there, the Yasso one. Thanks, Casey. Um, so again, social capital, the, the a silly example that I like to think about when it comes to social capital is, uh, so I grew up here in Southeast Texas um, with a, I grew up in a house full of boys and a mom that's like not particularly feminine. And so I remember when I was working for Texas Instruments one day uh, and when I worked for TI, I always wore high heels. One, I was I was much com more comfortable wearing them back then, and um, I didn't mind torturing myself wearing them. Um, but I would the the I would very quickly tear up the heels of my heels, you know, like the tips of your heels, and they just sort of come off. And so I was walking around one day, like literally on the screw because um, it had fallen off, and um, I didn't know that you could fix them. I just thought it's the end of these shoes, but I love the shoes and I didn't want to get rid of them. And then finally one day this woman stopped me and she like whispered, she's like, you know, you can fix your shoes. I was like, what? What do you mean I can fix my shoes? And she's like, yeah, just take them to like the local cobbler or the shoe store. And it, she's like, it tastes like, it's like five bucks and they put, re-tip them and you got brand new shoes. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is a bit of social capital that I had no idea existed. And it like 
I took like a dozen pairs and had them all retipped because those cobbled parking lots had like torn my shoes apart, you know? And, and so that's a silly example, right? But it's an example of knowledge. It's a flow of information that had never made it into my worldview. Um, and, and so when we think about all the social capital exists about how we function within systems, how we learn to go to college. Um, I remember somebody like, people often will ask, well, like, how did you know to do that? Like, how did you know who to ask? How did you know what to pursue? And sometimes I can think, well, well, I figured it out. Or a lot of times I think, well, I knew because I had other experiences that suggested I could follow this kind of series of steps and it would allow me to proceed into something. A hundred percent, I fully acknowledge that my desire to strive for a doctorate was about social capital. So for me, earning a doctorate was about creating a kind of social capital that I knew would afford me opportunities that the social class that I was raised in wasn't going to allow me, right? And so having doctor or PhD behind my name, that is a form of social capital that allows me access to things, that allows me opportunities that would not have been granted to me without that, right? Um, so that's the credentials. And so uh, when we do the case study, I want you to be thinking about this sort of form of social capital. And, and there's an assumption that we off, often make about, well, like, how do you not know that, right? Um, there was this woman that I used to work with. Unfortunately, she's recently passed away, which was really kind of tragic because she's young, but um, she worked on Capitol Hill doing policy work for the organization I worked with, um, that continue to work with. And I remember like, she would always annoy me because she's like, you don't know that? It's like, you don't know that this is how our government works? And I'm like, I asked you the question. No, I don't know. Like. But just that sort of way that she responded, like always made me feel stupid. And it honestly made me not like her because like, I felt like every time I had a conversation with her, I just felt stupid. And so I try really hard, even when I ask if people know something, I wanna make sure I'm asking, and it, like even when I ask, what did I ask a minute ago? Do you all know about, no, oh, I forget. I asked something and I was like, I'm always really careful about my language so that like, it's not a like, what do you mean you don't know it, right? Like you haven't read this literature. Like I never want to come off in that sort of condescending patronizing kind of way. Um, and because this is social capital, right? Like it's what you've known, it's what you've been exposed to, it's what, what, you've, what you've had access to. And what all that social capital is a function of the power and influence from your life um and your lived experience so we're going to keep this in mind and then last uh we get two more and then we're going to do the the case study so we've talked a lot about different ways of knowing and doing and from the literature um casey you can drop this citation in the chat this is is called funds of knowledge or sometimes it's called cultural resources i use it and how i talk to describe it as different ways of knowing and doing because most people don't always ascribe those other terms to those things but this the funds of knowledge's concept it was originally applied by um, Velez Banez and Greenberg in 92 to describe this sort of historical accumulation of abilities bodies of knowledge assets and cultural ways of interacting that were evident in U.S. Mexican households in Tucson Arizona so that's the sort of origin of this but in, by definition, it's the, all the resources, it's the knowledge, it's the practices, the beliefs and norms, the values that are then, sorry, I thought I heard running water. Um, I have trauma from when my house flooded a few years ago when pipes burst. So like every time I hear running water, I think that something's flooding. So pardon my little shock there, but so it's all of the sort of values that are derived from culturally specific lessons within the home space and the communities by people who have been most often subordinated by kind of dominant societies. And so we're going to think about the ways of knowing and doing the social capital. And then we've already talked last week. Um, and again, if you haven't made it this far in the curriculum, that's OK. You've got the PDF um, in the handout of the contrasting values that contrasts individuality versus the collectivism. And so in so people from individualistic cultures, they are more likely to have an independent view of themselves, they see themselves 
as separate from others. They define themselves based on their personal traits, and they see their characteristics as relatively stable and unchanging. And individualist, the United States is as a whole an individualistic culture. And so what that means is, is that for me, I was raised in a, a very typical um, individualistic culture household. So my sort of hardwired ways of knowing and doing align with individualistic cultural values. I have personal values to sort of be a more collectivist person, but I have to recognize that that's like not my MO. It is not my MO to function that way, my mode of oper modus operandi, mode of operation. Um, and so I have to constantly think about, I want to mirror some of these values, but how do I constantly practice them? So I hope that you get to that section in the course, you got the handout in the packet and certainly on the LMS as well. So you got these different, these values, now, these different sets of things. We're gonna do the case study here. So um, Casey, if you can shuffle the groups, um, we're, I'm gonna give you more than 15 minutes. Um, actually don't set a timer on this one. Um, um, I think I'm gonna give you 20, like, go ahead and set the timer for 20 minutes and then we'll check in and see how you're doing. Uh, but you're gonna download the PDF and independently read the case study. So the case study is um, the, towards the end of the packet. And then I've got a series of questions here. I want you to, to notice where, where do you notice the gatekeeping? Who was doing it? What did it look like? Um, in which ways was stewardship introduced? What did it look like? Who challenged it? What are some examples of non-dominant ways of knowing and doing that were evident? And, and this is a tenure candidate example, um, but I, I want you to apply it and think about what this might look like in whatever theory field that you're in. Just, I have to pick one example. And then what examples are opportunities to build the social capital of the candidate? So these are the questions. We'll start out with 20 minutes. Uh, Coach Grace said she's got to drop off at 1130, but um, you'll hopefully get some enriching conversation to start out. Um, and then I'll see you back. And I'm going to pop in your groups to join you in your conversations uh, for this. All right. Everybody got what they need? All right. See you back. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back. All right, so I was able to kind of pop in and be a fly on the wall and your conversations and it looked like you were having some rich, uh, thoughtful um, conversations. Um, certainly, I apologize if the tenure process felt foreign to any of you, um, but what I hope you are able to recognize is that it's a meeting of gatekeeping that many of us can probably relate in uh, to, to any kind of form or uh, a function of our of our field and occupation. So what I want to allow us a few minutes to do or to to have space for any questions, any um, sort of key takeaways that you'd like to share from your conversations um, or big ideas that you'd like to offer to the other group. So the floor is open. I shared that this should have been an email. Like, if not everyone's going to be in the room for a decision that needs to be made, why why are we here? And like, I appreciate April asking that, and then also seeing how it ended up. I would have just been like, all right, someone should have said this could have been an email. Yeah, admittedly, because I've worked for myself for so long, I sort of miss the sort of politics that happen with with team meetings but one of the things i do recall about academia and education specifically is there's a gross power dynamic when it comes to time and um and that people just don't show up for stuff that they're committed to and at least this is my experience in my own lived experience i imagine that this sort of passes across many fields but um, you know, time is a great reflection of, of respect. 
you know, um, we're not always going to be able to be on time. We're not always going to be able to show up for stuff, but like, I, I remember as a grad student at Purdue, like I would have professors just not show up to my meetings with them. No email, no call, no reaching out. I'm just standing there at their door waiting for them. And they let me know later. Oh, sorry, I was busy. All right, well, this is not my version of professional, but um, I see that sort of manifested in these meetings because I, I don't remember in the, I don't have the whole case study memorized, but like maybe people just didn't show up, right? So at that point they should have made a decision to say, hey, we're not all here. What's the value of this meeting anymore? But they decided we're gonna keep talking. Um, so they should have made that call, yeah. Uh, Sabrina pointed out that in any sort of HR hiring promotion kind of situation like this, there is an official checklist someplace and it should be present. And when people badmouth qualifications or say something doesn't count, you have to bring them back to, you know, this is what we've agreed on. This, They did bring in a $2 million grant. That's more than anybody's done in years. That counts. I don't care what you say. That counts. Or... You can't hold their maternity leave against them. That's part of the rules. You don't get to do that. The law. <laughs> right. It's the law. You cannot do that. Um, I was appalled at the lack of leadership from the person who should have been showing it, which was the department chair. He was, you know, even if he was wishy-washy on this promotion case, he should have been crystal clear on the rules and been holding the group to the rules, whether that's we don't have quorum, so we can't complete meeting. Uh it should have been him, not the other committee member knocking the the, the jerk back in line. You know, um, there were a lot of things going on there um, in terms of a failure of leadership and not just from a, is he gatekeeping or stewarding perspective, just not being a leader, not following his organization's rules. Um, yeah. Well, as a side note, I don't know that there is a checklist at all organizations and institutions. I think that I've worked yeah. for small organizations where there's nothing of that sort. The client that I um, that initially delivered this curriculum for for their tenure process, they don't have it. They have a tenure package, you know, like guide, but it doesn't have explicit an explicit rubric. Um, and so it's really kind of left to the to the to each tenure committee to not employ their biases and and how things get selected and chosen and valued. I can say the same for like job title promotions within organizations. I was responsible for writing them for tech, and I'm not a tech professional, right? And so a lot of them are very what I would consider HR blanket overarching ones that can be brought in with so many biases and can be read in like 15 different ways. And that's the point that it is arbitrary enough that we're not putting ourselves as professionals in a place where we're, we're setting very stringent rules. It, it becomes a very slippery slope, right? Because the system is quote unquote rigged against you for the person creating it, but also you don't wanna to be too exclusionary or overly the other option either, so. So I guess um, I do agree with all of what you all are saying. I think what I'm thinking about too is the importance of the four eyes of the oppression model and really the fact that most people talk about being collaborative and distributive leadership and shared leadership and um, people can see things, but we still have people, to Emily's point, one person's creating these things. Like maybe Emily can do the draft of it but then how can she then share it with a committee or a group of people that include human resources, that includes supervisors that will be responsible for making sure that this is done appropriately, that people, you know, professional uh, development and professional learning, um, you know, experts, curriculum people, coordinators, whatever you want to call them, you know, that's part of what I think institutional is, is really looking at those systems frequently, not just when a problem arises, but how can we be proactive? And so those are some of the thoughts that's going through my mind, where when we go back to our values or our North Star, we are making sure that it's constantly aligning. And when it does not align, 
we have a meeting, we construct practices, we set up structures, and that's what makes the organization continue to flow effectively so that the burden is not on one person or the person who's bringing the, 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 the challenge. Because you know, when we bring the challenge too much, then you're, part, you're considered a troublemaker or um, inappropriate terms such as blackballing and blacklisting and those types of things. So just for us to really think about and share out more how those four eyes play out um, daily, short-term and long-term. I like that, Sabrina. I also think like building that system within the meeting structure, right? Of, right, the norms like we do uh, at the beginning that Megan, your side at the beginning for every single meeting, these are the norms and we're all gonna hold each other accountable to it. So it's not just, Mike in charge of the department that's supposed to be leading and is doing a crap job and there's no guidelines for everyone else to hold them accountable. It's the same concept in those interactions. When I stopped to think about the social capital care, um, that should have started years ago, right? So um, she should, someone should have shared with this professor that she could say no to teaching all introductory classes. Someone should have told her um, that she could have insisted on teaching in her sub specific subfield of particle physics. Someone should have told her that she was um, going to have to advocate for herself and promote the idea that physics education research is real physics research. And she was going to have to, to socialize that idea across her department and have, you know, not just the champion of, of April and maybe Nathan, but like, the, you know, have other people on her side when that that when the door opened and people were going in to decide if she makes full, full professor, she shouldn't have been worried because even if Peter's always going to be there and Peter's always a jerk, she should have known that she'd socialize the idea that what she was doing was valuable and contributing to the field so much that, that there should have been less rancor in that meeting. But I also don't blame her for not knowing that that work had to be done somebody else should have guided her to that. I, I happen to know the professor who um, started the field of physics education research. When um, APS, the American Physical Society, started a separate subdivision for PER, they named Noah Finkelstein the first past president of that division because he'd done so much work to get it started. And he was on my committee for my dissertation. And he has had to give so many talks about why their field is physics and why it matters that a physicist does that research instead of handing it off to sociology or educational psychology or one of these other fields that is very much relevant to that work. He has had to make that case over and over again. And he, he lends his social capital to all the people doing that research very willingly because somebody did it for him. When he first started taking that up as his primary research, Carl Wyman, a Nobel Prize winner in physics, had to go to bat for Noah to say, this counts, this is real physics research, and if you don't count it, I'm leaving. He did eventually leave CU Boulder for other reasons, but it's not because they didn't accept Noah's research as valid. So I have watched this play out and I've heard the history of how this plays out in the specific field, actually. Um, but people love to say stuff doesn't count. That work, oh, that project, that didn't count. You, you worked so hard on that bid, but we got out bid, you know, bid and we didn't get the client. That doesn't count. That work actually does count because failures should also count. And, and we learn from our failures. You know, oh, uh, you ended up working with that class of kids. That doesn't count. Really? Why would that not count? Uh, sorry, we've gotten on one of my soapboxes. But the, the idea that the work doesn't count because it showed up in a way that didn't show up in my career, that's bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> it is total bullshit, Kate, I agree. But like, I, had, I recently had one that was like, oh, that metric's not useful. And it was the number of events that I helped host last year for, for, fan, for our employee resource groups. And I was like, oh, okay. That it's, it's, it's a hard one to hear. Like, yeah, exact, that exact reaction, exactly, right? It's hard to hear, you don't, and people use that a lot as an excuse, as an excuse, right? Yeah. 
Well, this is an incredibly rich conversation, and I'm grateful for your reflections and, and what you shared. I think the the certainly the takeaway that we recognize is that you know stewarding and our gatekeeping can happen in so many kinds of ways that the system is involved in so many kinds of ways. Um, one connection I didn't hear anybody make, but I'm sure that you were you were talking about it. But even in looking at the you know this comment on line 25 you know, critiquing April about being involved in the community, we can make some assessments maybe about her identity just on some of these stereotypical kinds of comments. Um, and what we know often happens is the system creates this internalized oppression that that people from marginalized groups work 10 times harder than they have to necessarily to kind of get the job and we can to get the recognition and we can see that april has done that and even still she's not being recognized for all of that labor and that work and so that again goes to the system of that which we value is that which we measure so if we don't value the contributions that people make to dei to education to uh to whatever those kinds of things are we'll critique them and say that it's not enough they've not done enough and continue to create and reinforce those barriers so i uh, i want to kind of close the loop here um th these are some of the other tools that um that you have all of these already on the LMS, but these are other ways that you can kind of create that shared language in any kind of setting, talking about the cognitive biases, talking about the unbiasing method and the session pledge. So um, if you want to download the specific things, they're there, but they're all on the LMS. You already have them. Um, before you go today, I do want to make sure that you kind of seal up all the 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 loose, you know, neural pathways that you've got here and reflect on what you've learned today. We need to think about some things that you've learned, a couple of things you want to do different, and one immediate action item. Um, we're, we're just up at the hour, so I encourage you to put the action item in the chat. Um, and we'll be able to continue this conversation on the learning management system. So our con uh, we'll be able to, to continue to share some thoughts on this together, even though we'll have to wrap up in a minute. So reflect and make a plan. All right, so if you want to share your takeaway, um, I encourage you to do that. I'll put a ping on the LMS to get some reflections there as well. Um, before we go today, uh, I, this is our final workshop together, but we are in no way done. You are, you are not rid of me. Um, in fact, you're all stuck with me. Um, and so I'm so grateful for um, your contributions. Again, the program's not over, just this was the final workshop. And so I hope that you'll certainly continue to schedule time with me if you want it um, and let me know how I can support you. But I will see you all on the Engineering Inclusion Network. I'm really grateful for you all. Y'all have a good day.